Back in 1953, Watson and Crick, frankly never really uh, uh, known for their modesty, walked into uh, the Eagle pub in Cambridge, in Cambridge and famously declared to anyone within earshot that they had uh, understand the secret of life. And the incredible thing was actually uh, they really weren't um, underestimating. Um, what they discovered was the molecular basis of how to encode information in biology. Uh, and it's that understanding of encoding information in biology that's driving the synthetic biology revolution today. Uh, and DNA now, instead of being, uh, you know, a very niche area of research understood by only a few people in Cambridge, uh, is everywhere. Everyone understands it and recognises the DNA double helix. It's really a universal symbol of the genomic age in which we live. It turns out, though, that we've been uh, manipulating DNA in one way or another for an extremely long time. So maize is not a natural species, right? It doesn't exist in the wild and it wouldn't persist in the wild. Uh, it, it only persists because we cultivate it. Uh, and it arose uh, around 9,000 years ago in southern Mexico by a deliberate process of domestication and, and selection. Now, the people who, who did this work obviously didn't know that they were working ultimately with DNA, but they must have surely known that they were selecting heritable traits. Um, and they were doing that so that they could improve their food source. And in fact, they did such a good job that 9,000 years later, it's still feeding a third of the world's population today. Once we realised that mutation was uh, an integral part of finding new heritable traits, we created more imaginative ways of doing it. So on the right here is, is an atomic garden. There's a radiation source at the centre of this, and the plants growing in that ring around it are basically being subjected to different degrees of DNA damage depending on how far away they are from that radiation source. Uh, out of this, the red grapefruit is something we're all familiar with that has actually been isolated by this process of radiation mutation. Uh, and the other aspect, uh, so since uh, that was first discovered and published in 1928, uh, this radiation method of mutation has been used uh, to create many thousands of uh, mutant new strains of uh, crops and plants. Uh, and it's these uh, varietals isolated in this way that drive modern agriculture. Of course, another key aspect of modern agriculture is industrialization. Right? This might not give us a very warm, fuzzy feeling, but the reality is uh, the mass industrialization of biology is how we feed the 7.4 billion people on our planet today. That population is due to rise to 11.2 billion by the turn of the next century. But agriculture isn't the only place where industry meets biology. All of these products here <coughs> have been created using recombinant DNA technology. So this is a much more precise manipulation of DNA uh, than the radiation experiments I just mentioned. So here, recombinant DNA technology is where we can take a piece of DNA from one organism and put it in another organism. If that piece of DNA expresses the enzyme chymosin and we can put it in yeast and produce chymosin enzyme uh, in very high yield, we can use it for cheese manufacture. <coughs> and that recombinant chymosin has been licensed for cheese manufacture since 1990 and it's now uh, the bulk of the, uh, how the enzyme is isolated and how cheese is made uh, since that time. So we no longer need animal sourced red in, rennet in order to make cheese. Similarly, the production of lactose-free milk requires the enzyme lactase, again, uh, overexpressed in a recombinant way. Our washing powder enzymes are not only overexpressed recombinantly, but those enzymes are engineered so that they work at low temperatures in the presence of detergent by changing the amino acid composition uh, of those proteins. Uh, the other examples here uh, involve not just expression of single proteins, but actually the manipulation uh, and optimization of biochemical pathways. So whether that's for the production of vit vitamins uh, or the production of highly valuable biological products like hyaluronic acid and fatty acids um, for pharmaceutical products. And L'Oreal even say innovation with gene science uh, on their marketing. Uh, tires, now we can manufacture isoprene by expressing isoprene uh, in uh, microbes rather than relying on uh, natural latex sources. 
uh, and natural latex is uh, the requirement for isoprene is predicted to outstrip natural supplies by more than 20% by 2020. So by being able to produce it in a, a, a fermentation setting rather than uh, a plantation setting means that you know, we can lessen the environmental impact of our requirement for these products because we won't have to tear down forests to build new rubber plantations. But of course, it's not just uh, household products where recombinant DNA technology is used. Arguably, the first synthetic DNA product uh, was developed way back in 1978, where the founding of uh, Genentech, now a major life science corporation, produced the first recombinant insulin. So they actually chemically synthesized the insulin gene uh, from constituent DNA bases and overexpressed human insulin in bacteria. The product uh, could be given to patients and was indistinguishable from human insulin. And of course, there are now millions of people worldwide who can live healthy lives as diabetics thanks to dev the development of these types of drugs. And so-called biologics are a hugely important part of the developing pharmaceutical industry, in particular things like recombinant antibodies, uh, which are developing new waves of cancer therapies. So this DNA technology is uh, hugely important for our, our life and our well-being. But if the first synthetic biology uh, product, and I'm not just talking experiment, but actual product, was, is back in 1978, why is it only now I'm talking to you about a synthetic biology revolution? Well, actually, a lot else has changed in the 60 years since Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA. Uh, here on, on the top left, you see what sequencing DNA used to be like. Right? It was a hard manual process uh, where you literally read by eye using a ruler the bases off of a polyacrylamide gel. Now, Illumina, who make these uh, machines down here on the right, uh, their latest population scale instrument uh, can sequence, is designed to sequence 18,000 genomes a year. That's 49 genomes a day. The first human genome sequence was published in 2003. It took 10 years and nearly $3 billion. Now we can do 49 in a day at a cost of around about $1,000 a genome. Right? So you do the maths in terms of what the cost per base of that is. So we now have a huge advance in terms of the information that we have in biology. Right? So biology is, is a data-driven science. We, have, we live in a digital biology world. We have more information of more genomes, more genome sequence than we could have possibly imagined even 10 years ago. If we live in a world of digital biology, the logical next step is to ask, can we program that biology? Right. So the other key technology that's coming through now is not just our ability to read DNA, but our ability to write DNA. So DNA synthesis now, there are new technologies coming around the corner which are going to have a similar uh, price crash in terms of the cost to, sequence, uh, to synthesize DNA, that is to write new DNA code. And just this year, there have been a couple of really important publications in terms of that, that really illustrate uh, our movement towards a programmable biology world. The first comes from the uh, J. Craig Venter Institute, where they published the, the first design and synthesis of a microbial genome. So this is the first genome ever that's actually been designed in silico and built from chemical synthesis and transplanted to boot up a cell uh, and create effectively a synthetic life form. <coughs> it, it didn't work first time around. And interestingly, to actually make an organism that grew robustly, they had to include 149 genes where they had no clue. They still have no idea what these genes do. So, it's clearly a lot about biology that we don't fully understand in spite of this data-rich world we live in. But experiments like this are also really important and fundamentally important about us learning uh, about biology still. The other uh, paper that I wanted to highlight uh, came from Chris Voigt's lab at MIT. And they've developed a computer code where you can assign at a high level uh, what you want the biological output to be. Their system then takes this computer code uh, and it effectively compiles it into DNA sequence. Right? So ultimately, those DNA bases are the way that we code biology. Right? And so they're interfacing between a high-level computer code, code and, if you like, DNA machine code. 
where the machine is the life form and when they transplant this circuit into the life form they get the behavior that's specified uh, in the original program. And you might have noticed that both of these uh, uh, papers are using this design, build, test, learn paradigm. This isn't a paradigm that comes from biology, this is an engineering paradigm. If you were building an aircraft, this is the paradigm you would use in terms of getting that aircraft to fly. You might think that's coming a little late to biology. Uh, why am I, we only talking about these kind of engineering cycles being used to design and build new biological systems now? Frankly, it's because we're only now developing the tools and technologies that mean that we can progress around and iterate around this cycle uh, in a meaningful time scale. Uh, and work that we're going on, is going on at Imperial College is actually addressing our ability to progress around this uh, design, build, test, learn cycle in a, in a rapid way. So some work that I've been leading here is around the aspect of DNA assembly. So I said we can use DNA synthesis to write DNA uh, and we use that to make our DNA parts. Uh, but then to make larger, more complex constructs, we need ways of stitching these together. So we've developed a modular standardized format for DNA that now allows us to build up DNA parts to create more complex uh, structures. Uh, and as an example with that modular format, here we have a test case experiment where we're expressing three different fluorescent proteins. We can control how strongly they're expressed with what's called a promoter at the front, and we can control the level of individual genes with these individual translation elements that we can apply to each gene. So we can rationally build these in this modular format and we can then measure the output. And from this, we can learn uh, what the prediction is in terms of being able, you know, what the design rules here are in terms of understanding the output of this operon from the input of the, the DNA circuit design level. A key question is actually how do we do this? Right, so the, th these hands belong to Rebecca in my lab. She's going to spend uh, a good deal of the three years of her PhD perpetuating small volumes of liquid. Right, this is the equivalent uh, in DNA sequencing terms of that polyacrylamide gel where you're reading base by base. Right, how do we get to the situation of that Illumina sequencing machine which can read 49 genomes a day? <coughs> Frankly, these machines are much better at doing highly repetitive pipetting tasks uh, than Rebecca is, or, or frankly anyone is. Uh, and this is what we're implementing here, right? So this is the state of the art uh, robotics lab that we have here at Imperial College, uh, where we are now automating uh, both DNA building and uh, measuring of biological systems. So what you see going on at the top here is our characterization robot, which is down here. Uh, and you can see the highly reproducible uh, a bacterial growth data that we can get out of this and from this we can determine our parameters uh, and get really kind of good repeatable biological measurements. Something that's not necessarily easy to do by hand uh, at the scale that we need to do it. So this is what biology of the future is going to look like, right? So <coughs> here the scientist is not spending a lot of their time doing repeated pipetting steps they're spending their time designing and learning. The building and the testing is being done by the machines. Okay, so this is the kind of workflow that we're implementing here. You know, to actually take uh, the high level function of the scientist out of the drudge work of the day to day bench work uh, and to get them to use their brains more uh, than their pipetting fingers. Uh, and this slide actually is taken from Amaris. So they are one of the leading synthetic biology companies out there. They can engineer strains at the rate of something like 300,000 strains a week in order to optimize those strains for production of useful chemicals and compounds. And I just want to take a few moments to, to say why uh, I think this synthetic biology revolution, this type of workflow is really important for our future. This is the world that we currently live in. Right? It's absolutely dominated by the petrochemical industry. Pretty much everything we touch on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's our food, our clothes, our homes, our appliances are all linked to this supply chain. And ultimately, this supply chain isn't clean and it isn't biocompatible. Whether it's the extraction, the transportation, uh, the refining, solvents used in manufacture, ultimately this is not biocompatible. A bio-based economy 
uh, could be much more biocompatible. Okay? The amazing thing about synthetic biology is that you can make biology with biology. So it's always the same four DNA bases, it's always the same 20 amino acids. It is inherently biocompatible. And not only can you make the biology, but that you can get that biology to make products. Right? So biology, as well as making our food, can make our medicines, our fuels, our materials. And synthetic biology can have a role to play in every single one of the arrows that you see on this diagram, whether that's a manufacturing arrow or a recycling arrow. We can harness biology to do these procedures that we need to. And I want to finish by, I've said quite a lot about bio, I want to finish by saying a few words about the economy. Every one of these arrows has an inherent value chain in it. What we need to do is we need to understand and find those value chains, and develop and apply the, uh, the technology required to exploit them. And if we do that, we can build our world uh, around a sustainable bio-based economy. And that's going to be necessary uh, for the sustainability uh, of our world, our well-being, and our future. And that's why we need a synthetic biology revolution. Thank you.